You can support the Double Loop Podcast by contributing at patreon.com slash double loop podcast. Thank you to our supporters, and we hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the Double Loop Podcast, your source for everything about fingerprints. While you're working on your comparisons, we'll talk about comparisons. I'm Eric Ray. And I'm Glenn Langenberg. All right, I got a double factoid today. Both factoids about reindeer urine. <laughs> you know, yeah, I know. It comes up every holiday season. I'm always asking these kinds of questions, and no one's around to answer them. And you know, you thought, oh, I've never heard a factoid about reindeer urine. Here's two. First, is uh, in in Finnish, there's a unit of measurement, a unit of distance called a poron kusima. Uh, it's <laughs> an obsolete unit of distance. But it is approximately seven and a half kilometers, and it's the distance a reindeer can travel before needing to stop to urinate. Because <laughs> that's how you measure uh, that, distance, you know. It's, in, it's uh, actually, I think that works for me, too. That's, that's, that's actually that's about the too. same for me. Uh, today, the word is still used, but not that specifically, but just to describe something that is some sort of obscure distance away. Um the other factoid related to reindeer urine has to do with um, the uh, fly agaric, um, or Amanita muscaria. It's otherwise known as the magic mushroom. It's the, it's the uh, hallucinogenic mushroom that grows in northern reaches of Asia and like Siberia. It's the, it's the mushroom that looks like the Mario mushroom. It's like the red top with the white spots. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, evidently... Um, Peoples back in you know olden days um, would watch as reindeer would like love to eat these mushrooms, and then they just kind of go crazy after eating these mushrooms. <laughs> and uh, it's one theory as to where this whole idea of flying reindeer came from, is that they would be high on magic mushrooms. Um, and since they're kind of dangerous to eat, you know, for humans, um, you can still kind of get some of the hallucinogenic effect by <laughs> drinking the urine of reindeer that have eaten these magic mushrooms. <laughs> now, That's you may awesome. have to follow them for a porankusama to get some, but... <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah, when you were up in Alaska, see if maybe you can try to work this out. Uh, that's maybe. great. No, that yeah. that's that's fantastic. <laughs> so and, and um, now I, I I'm wondering if it works with other things and for and could you do this with humans too? I mean, why limited to reindeer? Well, I I was you know peeking around looking for verification for these factoids because I had seen I you know heard about them and I was double checking and um, evidently the on the Wikipedia page for this this mushroom, it doesn't actually talk about the reindeer side, but about how that is a uh, shamanic or you know shaman practice for the shaman to eat the mushrooms and then the rest of the tribe to drink the, the to drink his urine. Urine, yeah, um, yeah, that's amazing. Wow, so, wow. You know, every religion's got its weird things. You know, we got the whole you know body and blood, or the whole. <laughs> I'm kind of glad we ended up with why. That's that's you know on the scale of what the other options are. That's pretty good. <laughs> that's pretty pretty good. Yep. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, on Glenn, that we have note, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, no 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 segue. We'll just jump right in. Um, we have the second half of our interview uh, with Anya Einseln. Uh So uh, let's cut over to complete our discussion about ANAB and accreditation and all that fun. Well, one of the uh, questions and, you know, um, probably should have led with this maybe in the beginning, <laughs> but one of the questions I have uh, for you is, you know, Anya, you've been teaching these courses and obviously you get a wide mix of examiners from different disciplines and you probably get lots of pet pattern evidence, people, whether it's fingerprints or footwear or trace or whatever. You know, pattern evidence sometimes, I think, well, all right, so <laughs> let me just put it bluntly. A lot of quality managers tend to come from DNA or the, you know, chemistry toxicology, I mean, a lot of them out there. And sometimes their interpretations tend to 
try to run that way where they will box the pattern evidence person into, well, this is what we do in DNA, so you need to find a way to meet the requirements the same way DNA is doing it or toxicology. And, you know, they're, they're not necessarily one-to-one, um, you know, analogies. So, But consistency, Glenn, consistency. consistency right, 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 right. <laughs> so I guess the question I have for you, the, just a general overarching what are some of the concerns you've heard from pattern evidence people taking these classes that are asking these questions about the transition? What are concerns and what are things that you've been hearing that maybe we should be just paying a little more attention to, or at least when we're updating our quality manuals, make sure that we address appropriately because it is a bit of a change and it is something that the pattern evidence specifically needs to pay attention to. And as an example, the one that you said earlier, look at the latent print first document the latent print or you know document that you did look at the latent print first that's something that many of us did but now it's going to be a requirement that agencies do that and it must be there what are some of those other pattern evidence specific things that might or shouldn't say specific but would need to be on our radar i would say the the two that i would like to probably prop up for you are going to be in the ar cl- Clause uh, 5.4.5.2.1, and that one specifically is the laboratory shall have a procedure for method validation. Mm-hmm. So there's there's some more rigor to that particular clause. Again, that's from the AR 3028 5.4.5.2.1. So it specifically outlines what the procedure for method validation needs to include. So those are items A through E. So that would be one piece. Uh, there still and, and, is... Are you looking at that um, not just as in validating, say, a new chemical for processing latent prints? So you're going to do a new dye stain. I mean, I think accredited agencies understand that we have to compare the new process to the old process for developing prints, but is this getting more specific to the interpretation method? That If you're going to practice what we say ACE-V in fingerprints, you need to have validated that internally, have some error rates, and uh, be able to demonstrate the validity of the method. I would say laboratories would need to have their ducks in a row when it comes to the practices they have in place. Now, I need to first identify that 54521 came into effect on June 1st of 2017. So if laboratories are already accredited to either the a and Legacy or the ASCLAD Lab International Program, there were general requirements in 17025 saying the laboratory had to use validated methods and, and the process of what is a validated method in forensic science could be approached a couple different ways. Um, What I would say is if a methodology such as ACE-V has been around for a while and the laboratory has been accredited for a while, it's it's probably not going to be as critical. Um, I want to cautiously use that word. Sure. What I would say is organizations that have not yet uh, pursued accreditation may need to take a very close look at 54521 and say, okay, how do we validate procedures in our organization? How do we how do we ensure that the method is valid? Now, I also do want to acknowledge that 5454 is is still around and the wording was actually lifted directly from the the Asphalt Lab supplemental Uh, Prior to implementation of a validated method that is new to the laboratory, the reliability of the method shall be demonstrated in-house against all documented performance characteristics of that method. Records of performance verification shall be maintained for future reference. Mm -hmm. So, So that piece of, hey, if this was an externally validated procedure... You know, you at a minimum need to do a performance check to verify that it works in your house. Um, I, I, again, I'm cautiously highlighting 54521 because this now actually requires the laboratory to have a procedure. Yeah. So I, w- I would say definitely be aware of that. Um, that's good. The, yeah, that's helpful. So, so I think that would be one piece. Another one that I would just want to make folks sensitive to, and probably not specifically to, let's say, latent prints or or uh, some of the other, I'm going to call them comparison sciences, mm-hmm. if folks are not reporting a quantitative value, um, I, I think 
you're probably still going to be pretty comfortable, but folks that are actually reporting quantitative values that are not, I'm going to call them descriptors. So if you say something is a seven inch knife, it's not that you are measuring it for precision that's exactly seven inches long. Um, you know, the intent is there is some type of statute out there saying if somebody has a knife that is greater than seven inches in length, then they can be charged with a felony. You know, the intent is I am reporting this quantitative value for the purpose of somebody in the justice system to use that information to decide whether or not somebody is going to be charged. So the other piece that, that I would like to present for your community to consider is Think about quantitative values that an organization is reporting. So the clause related to estimation of uncertainty of measurement uh, clause in the AR 3028 clause number 5.4.6.2.1, testing laboratory shall have and shall apply a procedure to estimate the uncertainty of measurement for quantitative test results. So in the past, the ASCOD Lab International Program primarily focused in um, on the, the toxicology community, uh, specifically bre- blood alcohol. That, right. was, that was a big focus there. Uh, drug chemistry, um, very specifically, as many laboratories had statutes regarding drug weights. So that weight was going to be used by the attorneys to decide whether or not they were going to charge somebody. And then finally, for firearms and tool marks, if somebody was shortening the length of a long arm and making it, quote, concealable, uh, many statutes were something like either barrel length or overall firearm length of 18 inches or less is considered a concealable weapon. So for those three disciplines, that was that was the primary focus of the ASCLED lab policies, of, of a lot of the guidance documents that were developed, a lot of the training that was developed by ASCLED lab. Um, whereas now in the AR 3028, the wording in 54621 is much broader to include all disciplines. Right. So, so I would say pattern analysis, for example, where they might mm-hmm. make a measurement or um, estimate uh, where the point of origin of blood is X, you know, feet off the ground, et cetera. That will now need some uncertainty associated with it. Correct. And and the other word of caution that I've been given by uh, some of the accreditation managers is we need to encourage laboratories to move away from a, the word approximately. Mm-hmm. Either either you have confidence in the measurement you're providing or stop providing the measurement. No, I like that. I, I think that that's, that's sound science. I think that that's good, actually. I mean, approximately suggests uncertainty. And if you have uncertainty, what is the actual uncertainty? Correct. So uh, again, the the note following 54621 states, an item descriptor that includes a number is not considered a test result. The difference should be clear to the reader of the report. So if you're describing something as a seven inch knife, you know, it's it's basically to differentiate it from the 13 inch knife that was also submitted. Its its intent was more of a descriptor than an evaluation of the item. This is uh, a question. I, I I'm actually a supervisor of a drug chemistry section. Okay. Um, so what about the number of pills? So let's say that there are 10 tablets and you're counting 10 tablets. And there really isn't an uncertainty to that measurement unless you're estimating it because you've got a thousand tablets. So you've got some instrument that estimates how many are present. But if you're right. counting a number of things, does, does that fall under that? Counting is not measuring because it's not traceable back to the international system of units. You Perfect. can actually go to the BIPM, which, forgive yep. my yep. French, but it's the Bureau International à poids mesure. Um, they hold <laughs> Very nice. all of the international standards, which include things such as, you know, the gram, the meter, Right. You know, you're, you're not saying, you know, there is no, quote, dose. There is no tablet in that listing of SI units of measure. Yep. So you are doing, and you, you use the perfect word, you're counting. Counting is not measuring. Excellent. It's not a measure end. Very good. Correct. And, and you could do the same thing, if I may. I'll give you the analogy over to digital evidence. They're counting the number of images on a hard drive. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's not measuring. You're, you're right. not measuring something if you're counting it. Oh, okay. So uh, the uncertainty of measurement at this point doesn't seem as if it's going to apply as much maybe to fingerprints. 
what about if we start getting into statistics and we start measuring, and, and I say measuring very loosely here, but we start, in fact, measuring is the wrong word. We start estimating. We start estimating a statistical frequency for characteristics. So we have a database of characteristics that, you know, um, that we're working with a, a reference database. And then we start to estimate the frequency of the characteristics that we're observing the latent prints. In some way, will that play into any of this? Again, I think because those characteristics aren't actually measurements. Yep. Well, um, they, they, I mean, aren't back, they aren't traceable back to the international system of units. Again, I think it would be rather difficult to apply uncertainty. Now, there may, there may be statistics that can demonstrate the frequency of something, but it's not measuring. It's not uh, part of the metrology process. Sure. Well, then again, most of those, most of the proposed systems that, if we get one eventually, would probably be a big chunk of it based on distance, which... But gets is... absorbed in the probabilities. Right, but, you know... That that's still a the, you know definitely a measurable thing. But, yes, I I I understand it, but there is you know I'm just saying that there is a a a strong component of distance that would go into the resulting number that comes out of a of a statistical model. Yeah, and I mean Anya, if we understand right though, it's ultimately what's being reported though. If the reported measure end is one of these. SI units, then the expectation is that there would be some uncertainty of measurement with that. Correct. Okay. Oh, okay. I, I would like to go back and and um, allow or, or encourage um, the inclusion of some text actually from 17025, which gives oh, sure. the laboratory some latitude regarding when it needs to be included. So the, the clause that may be beneficial for folks to be aware of is in 17025 clause 5.10.3.1, C as in Charlie, where applicable a statement on the un estimated uncertainty of measurement, information on uncertainty is needed in the test report when it is relevant to the validity or application of the test result, when a customer's instructions so requires or, and this is the one that you're going to like, Right. When uncertainty affects compliance to a specification limit. Hmm. So what I would say is, and, and the approach that was encouraged in the Ask Lab Lab policy and now reside, continues to reside in 51031C is you only have to include that uncertainty when you're around that specification limit. So for that drug chemistry section, if the, if the uh, felony statute is if somebody right. has more than 24 grams in their possession and the analyst weighed it and it was already 500 grams, the laboratory actually can say it didn't, the uncertainty that we have in our laboratory did not affect compliance to a specification limit. So we didn't, you know, they may say, okay, anything in excess of twice the statute does not require inclusion of the uncertainty statistic the laboratory is given the latitude to do that in 51031C. So I, huh. I just wanted to add that and say, hey, even if you've calculated it, 17025 still gives you some room on what that report's going to look like. I've always kind of wondered about that, you know, when getting that measurement of uncertainty and, you know, the the case is like three and a half tons of marijuana. <laughs> you know, we, yes. We're, we're over the limit, you know. Do, uh, you know is that is that... MOU still still attached to it uh, when it's it's just so crazy and over the top. One thing backing up real quick for that last one about the the validation of the method. Do you envision uh, ANAB or, or any uh, group like that uh, to provide some sort of I don't know, general guidance to the laboratory on how to do a, the validation of, um, of of a comparison method like latents or firearm tool mark or or qd because i can imagine I mean, right now it just seems like the way it's stated is that okay you come up with some sort of validation method and then we'll decide after you do it whether or not it's it's good enough um do, do you understand what i'm asking yes yes okay. i do and i would like to suggest that um most accrediting bodies are working close 
closely with the OSAC process. Okay. So if the OSAC process steps in and develops something, that would be the beginning of the conversation saying, have you evaluated this? Especially if the OSAC process gets to the point where they're actually publishing standards, recognized standards, then I think it's not going to be so much the accrediting bodies, but bodies such as um, DOJ, NIJ, you know, where they say basically, hey, if you're accepting funds from us, you have to be in compliance with OSAC published processes. Got it. And and then the enforcement element comes through there rather than the accrediting bodies. Um, again, it's it's the we're trying to move away from the how and focus more on the what. Right. So it's it's really going to be on that level of the community rather than the the accrediting bodies. That's that's something that I've consistently heard over the over the last several years. That actually dovetails right into my next question I had for you, which is um, with with OSAC, um, and I think you may have already answered it, but do you envision ANAB using the published standards from OSAC? as supplementals for accreditation um, or I may have what you seem to suggest is that that's going to be left up entirely to basically attaching the requirement of labs to follow those standards to any kind of money coming from the federal government. I think it will be driven more by the laboratories and the organizations of which they are part and, and any mandates or rollouts that come out as part of this. Um, I think within the United States, we are in a very unique position uh, when compared to many other countries and forensic laboratories operating in in other countries. Um, There oftentimes are very specific laws and regulations and accreditation requirements that are non-negotiable in other countries, whereas the United States, accreditation is still voluntary unless you're in one of seven states. And only Texas, if you take a look at their legislation, actually requires not only public laboratories, but private laboratories to be accredited. So I I would suggest the way that we have our government structured, both on a local, county, state, and national level, may drive who actually pushes that requirement. Um, I, I... carefully point back to the seatbelt legislation that was passed out on a national level decades ago. And there were some states that basically said, you know, to the federal government, they said, we don't need your stinking money. We're not instituting the seatbelt law. So it's it's going to be interesting. Um, I would carefully also say sometimes there are situations that occur um, for example, the the tremendous impact that something like September 11th had right. on the structure of the justice process and and the reporting structure and the creation of DHS and you know so there may be something large that comes out of something completely outside of our control that could drive um, whether or not accreditation is voluntary. It, it, they may say, you know, no, everybody has to be accredited, and that's the end of that. Um, but in my heart of hearts, I'm also taking a look. I, I kind of turn my head slightly, you know, 10 degrees to the east, and I take a look at the coroner versus medical examiner system. Yes. And and I see a lot of different variety. Um, I mean, even if we take a look at states versus commonwealths, I mean, we, we, we're not even consistent as a country on that. So I, w- I would cautiously kind of back away saying, based on other things that are in place, based on other structures that are in place, I, I don't see accreditation or compliance with OSAC being mandated unless there is a rather seismic shift due to something, again, happening outside of forensic science that causes the community to come together and say, no, we have to do it this way now. It's, it's not negotiable anymore. So that's, that's again, just kind of a, a lot of conjecture on my part. 
So t- to that point, and I'm, now I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit and ask one, <laughs> one of those questions, because some of our listeners um, work, work in laboratories that, that are not accredited. In fact, quite a few listeners are. And, you know, they themselves may want to get <laughs> go through the accreditation process, but their management is not interested. And so sometimes they'll make the argument, well, you know, we do have SOPs and we do have procedures, but we're, we're not accredited and our management doesn't think it's important to as long as we have these SOPs. So, you know, with your experience of traveling around the country and you probably – and the world – and – you probably have met many different students who go through your your courses and then ultimately don't, you know, end up getting accredited or don't go through the application process. What value do you see if you could talk to the listeners and say, look, here's the value of being accredited and this is why this is important. And then what can they do to convince their management? If anything, what are some of the best arguments that you've heard over the years to go to their bosses and say, look, this is why we have to do this. There are two pieces that that I think, um, first being the largest, which is criminals really don't care about borders. They will do illegal stuff everywhere. So if that organization that is interested in seeking accreditation or interested in exploring accreditation you know, if they believe that they are in an environment, if they are dealing with um, customers, law enforcement who need their help, and that's truly what it is. It's, it's this laboratory is helping law enforcement. Um, if they believe that they're in an environment where there could be criminals that are hopping from state to state, county to county, country to country, Having that confidence, having that incom- that, that intercomparability of my results to your results, because we do have this common foundation of accreditation. We have this consistent practice of, you know, here's how my test report is structured. Here's how I maintain my examination records. This is the training and qualification process for my analysts working in these forensic disciplines. I think recognizing the fact that Criminals get around, and they do lots of bad stuff everywhere, and the population of the world is not getting any smaller, <laughs> and the world is getting smaller. We, we are so much more in contact with each other. I think it, it's one of those pieces of if you truly live on an island, if you have your small community and nobody comes in and does bad stuff and... and You know, or if the bad stuff is rather minimal, then yeah, you know, maybe maybe there's a possibility that it doesn't add enough value for you because it it is going to be an investment of time and energy and effort and resources to get your organization accredited. But if you are part of that larger justice community, if you are part of that larger law enforcement community, if you believe that there are these elements that, you know, float in and float out of your community then I think there's an obligation to be part of that larger community of forensic science. So I think that's, that's the first piece and, and one of the very valuable pieces. Um, another conversation, and I literally just had this two weeks ago. I had, and, and I thought it was, I, I smiled when you said internationally as well, um, I had the tremendous opportunity to present uh, yet again at the Asian Forensic Science Network meeting over in Singapore and uh, had a, a lovely conversation with a gentleman whose laboratory is not accredited um, from a relatively small country. And, and he and I had kind of a, that, that exact conversation of how do I talk my management into thinking about accreditation and what value it can add. And the, the message I gave him, and, and I'm hoping this would be relevant to your listeners as well, is it's much like making an investment in an education, whether it's a, you know a basic education, finishing high school, um, or or getting that undergraduate degree or pursuing a graduate degree. We all, as individuals or even as families, make this investment in time and energy in supporting one another. You know, obviously, for those of you that that have children that are in junior high, high school. 
I mean, it requires time and energy to get that student to sit down, do their homework, write their papers, do the research. You know, if you want them to go to college, make application. You know, this is this is not an easy peasy process. This is this is requiring effort not only by that student, but by their support structure, by their by their family members, um, their coaches, their teachers are involved in that process. So. Um, and then similarly, moving on, getting an undergraduate or a graduate degree, you know, that's not easy. That requires time and energy and research and effort and, a, you know, applying themselves to this process. And at the end, you have this degree and that degree will take you to amazing places. And I consider that accreditation process and achieving accreditation, much like receiving that degree, it, it allows you to have collected a lot of information about yourself and about the world and then have those strategic and, and, and wonderful conversations with your peers. So um, I know it seems, it seems a little bit um, philosophical, but, but I, I do believe. I no, do believe no. very, very much in both of those. I, I, I really like that analogy. I, I do. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's almost like the, the, a little bit like the vaudeville joke, can't hoit. Can't, can't hurt, yes. Can't hurt. Can't, can't I know, hurt. You, were, you were doing the New York variation on that word. I understand. <laughs> right. Um, I, I, I happen to agree with your... I, I agree with, with both of those. And now I'm picturing talking to a chief of police <laughs> who has a budget for cars and, uh, you know, flak jackets and guns and cops and stuff. And <laughs> trying to convince him of those i mean I, I i do love that answer i think it's great i i'd like i'd like to see that police officer or police uh, police management understands this value i mean i think as you know i mean you see state laboratories and laboratory testing facilities are on board with this it's trying to get the small police agencies that do either crime scene or do latent prints and it's one or two police officers and they're kind of out there on their own on a little life draft and we want them to join our community we want them on the big ship we want to save them but it's um it, it's it's tough convi- you know convincing their management to put all that time and investment in it but i, I think that's a great analogy and I would say those chiefs of police of those smaller entities are probably folks that have um, maybe later in their career gone back to pursue an undergraduate degree or maybe supporting the first generation of their family to pursue and, and get that undergraduate or you know accomplish that next academic goal. So I, I think it might be an audience that's ready to hear that and, and kind of nod their head and say, okay, now I get it. So oh. I, I think it's, it, I'm hoping it'll be helpful. All right, Anya, this has been fantastic. I, thank you so, so very much for coming on uh, the podcast with us, uh, for putting up with, um, you know, a couple technical issues at the, at the beginning as we got all the computers working uh, to link up Arizona to Minnesota to Virginia. But um, you know, your insights and knowledge on this topic is has been fantastic and um, i'm sure uh listeners across the you know the continent and you know overseas as well uh, i've definitely gotten a lot out of this so thank you so much well i really appreciate being asked and and i'm flattered that that you think i could add to this conversation and uh hopefully continue my my little ongoing effort with with my with my new company, my new organization, and hoping hey, please, to uh, tell the listeners too about your website and the resources that you offer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so my new website for my little one person company is called Sea Glass Training. Um, the website is seaglasstraining.org. dot org. And there's some hopefully useful information up there. I look forward to being able to provide training and consultation services to the forensic science community, uh, providing presentations for regional and national organizations, as well as I am absolutely pleased to answer anybody's questions or requests for clarification, especially since we have the new version of 17025 coming out. So I look forward to having many, many conversations about the, the uh, development of that new document, as well as also watching very closely what the accrediting bodies will be doing to 
align their accreditation programs. So um, if that's another conversation that we want to have, I, I look forward to that conversation. And um, I, I look sh forward to sharing that information as it, as it becomes available. Yeah, I imagine a lot of people have your number on speed dial. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do um, enjoy a lot of wonderful friendships and, and associations with uh, a, a large volume of folks. And, yeah, and my... how, how many emails start with help in the <laughs> attention subject line? <laughs> I am always there to help, and, and I look forward to hopefully continuing in that capacity. And, and my, my husband definitely has this running uh, tale or running uh, description of me. He basically says, oh, yeah, she knows every lab director in the United States, every forensic lab director in the United States. And then I kind of... I'm like, oh, no, I don't. And then I went, well, actually, maybe I do. Quite do a few yeah. of them. So, so I, I do hope to continue to be um, a helpful resource for folks because I know um, change is not comfortable. Change is not something that, that a lot of folks want to deal with. But if we could make it interesting, if we could make it reasonable, if we could make it helpful um, and, and not too scary, then, then I'm hoping I can fulfill that role. Yeah, and, and again, I, I mentioned in the last episode, but uh, I, having taken your, your class, I would recommend to anyone out there to, to go and take an assessor class from you. You're, you really are an, a fantastic instructor. You make quality assurance as fun and as interesting as possible for those <laughs> that do not find it fun and interesting, but you, you do. And uh, you have you know, these great scenarios to work through, and you, you teach them all the, the important um, skills for finding requirements, finding how the, you know, how to use these requirements and, and um, just, you know, the entire assessment process. You, you made it very crystal clear to me. And I think I took your class, I don't know, 10 years ago, maybe longer. And I still really do remember many, many parts of it. Well, I'm, I'm flattered that, that you can recall that information and I'm impressed that you remember all that information. But yeah, it can be uncomfortable. And it's it. I, I remember sitting in those chairs. I remember having to learn those clauses and, and basically asking myself, there's got to be a better way to do this. There's got to be an easier, more reasonable way of doing that. So I'm, I'm just glad that I can provide a lot of my own experiences and, and a lot of information to help it be a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more approachable. I think that's that's always my goal is, is making something more approachable and kind of understand the philosophy and the reasoning behind that. So just as a quick clarification point, please be aware that the accrediting bodies are the ones that offer the technical assessor training program, whereas the focus of my organization will be on customized internal auditor training or uh, consulting services if a laboratory would consider that helpful. The accrediting bodies really get to control the structure, the process of qualifying technical assessors. So they really are responsible for that piece. So if, if for example, an agency is considering accreditation, you might do a gap assessment or um, you know, these are the things you kind of need to think about or uh, right along those lines? Absolutely. That, that would be something that I could help them with. Fantastic. Again, like Eric said, thank you very much for taking the time. And uh, boy, I, I hope you get some emails and I hope you get some contacts uh, from our listeners. Well, I, I do thank you for, for reaching out. And I, I hope that both of you have a wonderful weekend. Well, thank Thanks, you very Anya. much. Uh, all right. Well, so that was our interview with Anya Einseln, uh from, well, still working part time with uh, uh, ANAB and also, you know, running her new company now sea glass training um, yeah we and... should probably make that clear it's s-e-a glass g-l-a-s-s -S yes dot org training dot org yeah and uh, that that was i love that interview glenn that was fantastic i know uh accreditation and how that kind of stuff isn't everyone's bag of tea but um uh i i had a great time you know listening to her talk about all these different topics oh yeah i mean she she knows this stuff down. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, and I do want to thank to uh, shout out to Jason Jardine down in uh, Broward County. Uh, he he had taken her class, and I was 
going to ask him, hey, you want to come on and maybe talk about, you know, some of the, you know, the upcoming changes. And he's like, why don't you just get Anya? And I thought, <laughs> yes, that is a great idea. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jason, for uh, hooking us up there and uh, setting this up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so any final thoughts uh, from uh, from this two part interview? Well, right. I, I think we have what three episodes here dedicated to quality assurance yeah. issues and, and changes coming. So, I, you know, I, I, you know, it's important to me and you that the community be aware of these kinds of changes and to keep up with them. I, I think it's in the best interest of the latent print community. You know, like she said, to educate ourselves, to get those degrees, to invest in our education. I really like that analogy, and I, I think it's very, very true. I, I think there are certain things that fingerprint examiners have been doing that are a little bit above and beyond some of the other disciplines. We've been leaders in some ways. We certainly got more involved in blind verification before some of the other disciplines we got more involved in annotating uh, images i think before some of the other disciplines there's a, some exceptions and you know the idea of uh, you know sequential analysis yeah. you know, these kind of things that error rate calculation these are things that we've we've been leaders in so i think it's important for us to to continue on, on that and these changes coming don't seem insurmountable i i think many of them are just clarifications of things that already existed with a couple of exceptions that anya pointed to that the bar was raised a little bit but again not i don't feel that it's so far out of reach that it's out of touch or or impossible i i don't i don't i don't necessarily see these changes as as being very burdensome and i i was worried about that before talking to anya and, and reading them myself I, I was hearing from other examiners, oh, we're going to have to do this now, we're going to have to do that now. I don't know that things are going to change drastically if you are already accredited to ISO 17025. Yeah, I, I, I really don't, especially after this discussion, I, I don't see any major changes coming through that hasn't already started from uh, ASCLAD Lab under the ISO standard. Um, yeah. yeah we, we've already been through quite a few major changes um, from just accreditation and on then going to the actual standard um, and just from you know, just the history of, of latents. But especially after hearing her talk, I don't see major things changing. But Or if major things do change, it's, not, it's probably not going to be system-wide. It's going to be because certain labs uh, choose to make changes to, right. in, in, <laughs> in their own policies. Or have misinterpreted the the requirement, right? To be way more um, than what the the more of the minimum end of the requirements actually say. Yeah. Uh, hey, one one other thing. Did you notice that uh, she always seemed to refer to it as A N A B, but yet we we often were A N A B. Didn't didn't seem on board with that. I I I've started now. I, I think as the episode went on, I kept I started saying A and A B more often. Um. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> she I think she politely uh, was trying to signal us. Hey yeah. guys, it's A and A B. <laughs> I, I I and I actually had heard. I think I've even mentioned that when the, that first episode we talked about yeah. it. Yeah. Um, that <laughs> uh, that's I guess a thing. I I don't know. Why ANAB is is bad, but um... I might just stick with it to irritate QA people. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. There you go. We'll we'll, uh, we'll continue to endear ourselves to uh, uh, you know the great state that includes Chicago. You know yeah. Illinois. Um, Illinois. Just just <laughs> mispronouncing it just because <laughs> we know they love it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, all right. Um, yeah, uh, again, super glad that uh, we were able to get her on the podcast. And uh, um, and lo actually looking forward to hearing from uh, examiners out there. Uh, if they're hearing different things from, um, from other people or uh, if they're starting to go through any kind of process or if their lab is, is pushing through more changes than what uh, Anya really described here. Um, uh, definitely interested to see to 
see how all this you know works out and to hear from uh from people uh on this issue um uh, there's there are a few things you know more um more riled up than a latent print examiner who is being forced to change the way they've always done something <laughs> <laughs> so um all right Glenn, anything else to to uh, uh to, to talk about before we wrap things up uh, i'll just uh quickly plug some classes like i did uh just on last episode sure. too that got some classes coming up some advanced ACB classes uh, next year in 2018 in uh, laguna hills in california at the end of february and then another one in samford florida uh, that's mid-april april 16th through april 20th go to ron smith and associates.com if you're interested in registering for any of those classes uh, and I'm starting to book dates for 2018 for exclusionology. Uh, so if your agency or region has an interest in that, um, I've, I've been to Virginia many times. I've been to Northern California and Southern California many times. Uh, other parts of the country I know need to hear this stuff too. So um, uh, have me come on out and visit. If you have any questions or comments about this podcast or anything we want to talk about, uh, Anything you want us to talk about on this show, email us, eric at rayforensics.com or glenn, G-L-E-N-N, at eliteforensicservices.com. Listen to us, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iTunes, uh, give us a rating, look us up on patreon.com to search for Double Loop Podcast, and then also, as always, the opinions on this show are those of the people talking and not necessarily of any agency that they may represent. So I'll talk to you guys all next time. Bye, everybody. Have a good week.